Right, hello everybody. Welcome to our Friday forecasting talks. Today we will have a presentation by Thomas Willeman and I will come back to that in just a moment. But before we do that, I wanted to say a couple of words about the center. So Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting is organizing these events. And here we are. Uh, this slide summarizes our services, our expertise and our people. You might see that we run or try running short courses. Uh, we are trying to run the online forecasting with our course. Uh, we do consultancy, master projects. We develop uh, or help developing software for different companies. And we have expertise in areas like marketing analytics, supply chain forecasting. I think that the, the strong part of the center is demand forecasting in different aspects for different uh, businesses. And here is uh, the list of all the members of the center. Right, if you're interested in our events, you can get in touch with us. For example, you can follow us on Twitter where we publish announcements for these webinars and other things related to our activities. There is also a LinkedIn account. Um, you can send us email or there is this uh, official website of the center. And last but not least, we also have our YouTube channel where we publish all the recordings of uh, these webinars and some other events that we have. OK, so today we have uh, Thomas Willeman. So Dr. Tom Willeman is a professor emeritus of industrial and systems engineering at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And he is a co-founder and the senior vice president of Smart Software Incorporated. And he, he also has this uh, line in his CV that uh, he's a former intelligence officer, uh, which uh, supposedly was the dark side <laughs> of the moon uh, for Tom. So Tom, over to you. Well, good afternoon or good evening or good morning to all the people attending this. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to at least virtually be back at Lancaster. Uh, I spent a glorious sabbatical uh, period at the university back in the year 2000. And uh, Robert Files was one of the people who was very gracious to me at the time. And I think some of the other people are in the audience and it's it's good to be back with you. And of course, good to be with all the people who are watching. Uh, today's topic is about time series scenarios, how to do it and make it pay. So we'll be talking about a particular aspect of the whole ecosystem of demand forecasting and inventory management. And first, let's start by understanding what we believe scenarios are and how they might be used. Uh, in words, scenario planning is identifying a specific set of uncertainties, different realities of what might happen in the future of your business. In pictures, you see two uh, time series plots. For today, we're restricting our attention to scenarios that look like that. They're sequences of, for instance, demand excuse me, demand for a spare part or a, a finished good. And we want to be able to take an example from the re real world and similar to the miracle, the loaves and the fishes, we want to turn one into a bounty of other similar but not identical scenarios. And we would use those for many purposes. And the one that we'll be focused on mostly today is to, if you will, stress test an inventory control system uh, to throw at it many different situations and see how well it performs to convert a demand scenario into key performance indicators, KPIs, and use those to guide the design of an inventory system. For instance, what are the reorder points and what are the order quantities that would do the best job for a particular item? Uh, but before we get to the application, we'll be talking a little bit more about uh, where the scenarios come from. If you're familiar with discrete event simulation, um, the, the uh, dialog box on the right hand side of the screen may be familiar. Uh, it is a way of generating arrivals, say, to a queuing system and the time between arrivals. So 
simulation models are fueled by input scenarios. And usually commercial simulation software will have a module like this, which will give you a number of theoretical uh, choices for how the spacing of interarrival times plays out. Um, that's common. It gives you many scenarios that I will call synthetic, not to use the word fake. Um, and they're not exactly real to the extent that the models don't really capture the ugly reality of the arrival process, but you can certainly generate lots of them in a hurry. Just click the OK button and out they spew. On the left is a record of what's called a trace, a record of what actually happened in a real system, a record of true arrival times that are measured in a real system. So that is a counterpoint. It's not synthetic. It actually is a real world scenario, but you've only got one. So we have a kind of dilemma. On the left, we can get something that is all of reality in all its complication, but you've got one of them. On the right, you have an infinite number of not quite real scenarios. And I'm going to be talking about a technique that might bridge the gap and give you many, essentially an unlimited number of scenarios that share the reality of the actual real world uh, system. And the way that will go, if you focus on the left here, is we start with what's called a trace, a record of, of uh, what actually happened in a system. Let me see if I can get a better pointer. So here's the trace. And we use a technique called the statistical bootstrap to turn this into many copies that are not clones, uh, but are essentially realistic alternatives that could have happened in the real world. And any number of those that we need, and those go into some sort of a system model. It could be a model, for instance, of an inventory control system to see if these are demand patterns to throw very different demand patterns at the at the model and see how well the design performs and allow us to change the model and try again with computer experiments to see if we can do better and design a better model. The on the right is a, a much less used, but I think underappreciated application where the bootstrap samples actually become visual time plots or they're used to to uh, animate dials and gauges in a control panel, and they don't go into a simulation model. They go into a human eyeballs and then a human brain. And they're used, for instance, for training operators. And if we have time, we'll talk about that application and how to make the bootstrap create uh, copies of the original data that are indistinguishable to the human eye. But we'll be focusing on the left where we're saying we're going to drive a, some sort of a computer model of an inventory system using uh, essentially unlimited number of demand scenarios. So there are many ways we can create scenarios and there are a couple of criteria we can use to decide whether the scenarios are good or bad. So here are four sources of scenarios. The first I call Geppetto's workshop. Those are essentially handcrafted um, scenarios. It's typical of war games, for instance. In a war game, there may be a number of active duty and retired officers who were assembled to create a situation, a tactical situation for analysis. So they, the workshops may produce a scenario that says, the good guys are here, the bad guys are on the other side of a mountain, there's a river in between, and there's a few tanks here and there. And uh, let's see how the red team does against the blue team. So that's Geppetto's workshop. Or it might be a couple of expert cardiologists piecing together exotic uh, EKG waveforms to use in training intern physicians. The second um, source is what I call Groundhog Day. If you're familiar with that movie, you have one real world scenario, the trace, 
and you just replay that over and over again. You, you just use it to bombard different system designs and see what happens. The third is to use stochastic process models, like maybe the most famous is the Poisson model, and that's what um, uh, I was showing when I showed the computer simulation software. There are a number of theoretical models that we all learn about in Statistics 101 or Operations Research 101, and those can provide an unlimited number of perhaps realistic scenarios. And the fourth, which is the focus of my remarks today, is something called the non-parametric time series bootstrap. And we'll talk about at least one example of how that can work to create scenarios of spare part demand. So we have four different sources. How do we rank them? How do we decide whether they're adequate to the task of designing systems? And the four criteria that come to my mind are fidelity, variety, quantity, and cost. So fidelity means that we want to create scenarios that mimic and loosely speaking look like real data streams. So they have to be somewhat physically real. And the little uh, aphorism here is don't let the thunder precede the lightning. In the real world, you first you have the lightning, then you have the thunder. So the scenarios you come up with cannot be so weird and unphysical that they have no credibility. Perhaps credibility is a synonym for fidelity here. The second criterion is variety. Um, we need to create scenarios that reflect the natural variation across real data streams. So an aphorism would be, please don't give us the Groundhog Day scenario, because that's the same thing over and over and over. If we're stress testing a system, we have to throw different problems at it. So we need to have a variety of different looks to the scenarios that come out without losing fidelity to the real data generating process. And then more operational metrics are quantity and cost. In terms of quantity, we obviously covet large numbers of scenarios, so please don't give us just two instances, which you might get out of a, a group of retired military officers concocting interesting tactical scenarios for a war game. And finally, cost. Uh, we would love to have scenarios that don't break our computational or labor budget to produce. So you don't want to handcraft each scenario using a team of overpaid PhDs, although there's some argument about whether a PhD could ever be overpaid, I'm sure. So fidelity, variety, quantity, and cost. And this little table sort of eval evaluates each of the sources according to the criteria. So Geppetto's workshop, <clears throat> if Geppetto was really the craftsman we think he is, um, we can get okay fidelity out of that, but we get little or no variety or corresponding to little or no quantity, and it's probably very expensive to, to handcraft a small number of scenarios. The Groundhog Day scenario by definition is, is good on fidelity because it is a sample of the way the world actually worked at least once. And the cost is okay because you've collected the data, it, it already exists, but you're lacking in variety and quantity simultaneously. The parametric um, process models are good for variety. Every time you click the OK button in the simulation software, it will spew out different looking sequences of demand, for instance. You get essentially an unlimited number and they're cheap. You just click OK and boom, you've got 10,000. Uh, sometimes though, the fidelity is lacking. For instance, if you think about demand for spare parts and you want to assume as I believe the Royal Air Force at least used to, that demand for spare parts has a Poisson distribution, the demand could be multimodal, even bimodal, have two humps in it. The Poisson is constrained to have one hump in it. And so there's always some uh, limit on how ugly the data can look when they come out of a parametric model. 
and you can start to build composites of you know two different a mixed Poisson model. You can try to keep up with ugliness, but the world seems to be able to outpace our cleverness and and come up with complications and quirks and kinks uh, that parametric models have difficulty tracking. So my argument is that a bootstrap approach has potential to be OK on all four dimensions that we can if you do the bootstrap correctly, it's possible to for the bootstrap to be totally unrealistic, but there are some theoretical results that guide the, ch the choice of bootstrap parameters of how the bootstrap is implemented so that we can get high fidelity. We will by construction get variety, large quantity, and the cost is minimal in the same way as it is with parametric uh, stochastic models. So potentially the bootstrap is, is a good addition to the toolkit of an analyst who wants to design systems and then simulate their performance before they're deployed so that you can tune the design for the best possible chance of success. <clears throat> Excuse me, so let's now think about generating scenarios for a particular kind of demand called intermittent demand, which has been maybe, a, I could say, a fixation of mine for some decades. Um, and we'll talk about a technique called the Markov bootstrap to do that. <clears throat> uh, as Yvonne mentioned, we have a, a software company in Boston called Smart Software, and we had gone decades without ever hearing of intermittent demand. And as usually happens in the commercial world, you you uh, you're lucky to have customers who complain because that's the way you can improve your products. So one day somebody called and said, you know, your software is just doing a horrible job. And we said, show us. And they showed us a pattern of demand that we'd never seen before. And here are some examples of four different time series of monthly demand for four different spare parts. And you can see uh, two immediate features of those plots. You see spikes and you see gaps. And hence the word intermittent demand. It's there and it's not there. Sometimes there is something happening and a lot of the time nothing is happening. And it turns out this is an especially nasty type of demand to try to manage in terms of inventory optimization. And there are, besides it's very, uh, intermittent nature, there are some complications that might be a little bit hidden unless you look a second time. For instance, down here, you can see a pattern where there was a large spike, then there was a long gap, and then things got relatively busy with few zeros. Uh, this is an example of what's called burstiness. And if the demand has a characteristic called positive autocorrelation, you can get this kind of bursty behavior, feast and famine. There'll be long periods of, of quiet, and then there'll be an ambush where all of a sudden your inventory system uh, has to meet a flurry of demands. And then you get geared up for that, and maybe you set very high stocks to take care of that. And then you have to suffer through very quiet periods where people are looking around and saying, why do we have so much sitting on the shelf? Nothing is happening. So you get whipsawed between nothing and a lot, and that's a, a difficult problem to manage from an inventory point of view. So these are examples of what we mean by intermittent demand. So we had to develop a way to uh, generate scenarios that look like this as inputs to inventory calculations. <clears throat> I'll show you now a little cartoon about the dynamics of inventory and some of the key variables and how we can use forecasts of intermittent demand to map into design problems on inventory on the inventory side. So in the vertical axis you have inventory. Think of that as the number of spare parts sitting around on a shelf waiting to have their life fulfilled and be plugged into some machine. And on the horizontal axis, we have time, and maybe we'll say that's a day. So the inventory manager will start off by des uh, having a preliminary design, and he might say, I'm going to define a reorder point at that level. And a reorder point is a trigger level. And we're asking, 
that to do the following job. When the inventory hits that level, as it sinks down and hits that level, that's a signal that it's time to get more. There's a second uh, companion design pr uh, parameter, companion to the reorder point called the order quantity. So the reorder point says when you want more and the order quantity says, and how much will you order when you want more? So here's the reorder point. And in a typical scenario, you start out at a certain level of inventory. And then after some random amount of time, there's a random drawdown in the stock. So it, it might be intermittent, it might go several days with nothing happening, and then you get an order for so much. And that continues along until you reach the reorder point. <coughs> Excuse me. At that point, it's like a gun went off in a foot race. There's a race between supply and demand. The supply side is the replenishment. At that point, when the rear point is, is, is reached or breached, if you go through it, you ask the supplier to send us some more. And they're working on assembling that and shipping it to you and you're putting it on the shelf and making it available. So there's a lead time between, between when you ask for it and when it's available for use. And that's when the race ends. And on the demand side, the world is going to continue intermittently asking for some of what you've got. So it will be staggering down like this. And at the end of the replenishment lead time, you will have had a total amount of demand during the lead time, which is called, oddly enough, the lead time demand. That's the key random variable that we want to use the scenarios to generate. What will be the lead time demand. How many uh, spikes in that intermittent demand process will occur and how big will they be during a, a replenishment lead time? <clears throat> and when we reach the end of the race, that is the replenishment lead time is over and we get a restocking in a quantity called the order quantity, we have completed one replenishment cycle. And the key performance metric here, there are several, but one of them, perhaps the most important is, did you survive that cycle without stocking out? If you care about customer service, that's got to be a primary performance metric for the inventory control system. So we want to know for a given reorder point, an order quantity, what's the chance we can get through a replenishment cycle and everybody who asks for our stuff gets our stuff. A service-oriented uh, approach, and that's called the service level. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm having some spring allergies. We'll take a cough drop. So the, the scenario generator will give us this part of the curve, and it will be different every time. And we can choose an inventory uh, design in terms of reorder point, for instance, and then use the scenario to generate simulations and see how often can we do what we want to do, which is to meet all the demand. And now we'll talk about a way to do that for intermittent demand. It's not the only way, but this is a way that's proved very successful in practice. So here's a little toy example of a data set. There are 12, let's say 12 monthly observations. And we have uh, integer counts, it's intermittent. There's four in the first month, and then we have two dry months with no demand. Then we have a burst of three months with nine, three, and two. And then another dry period and another active period in zero and five. So this represents intermittent demand. And the way we process this is to first break it into two pieces. We say, let's just think about whether there's demand or not demand, zero or X. And we're going to make a model of this. And that's the Markov part of the Markov bootstrap. And then when we have scenarios that are composed of zeros and X's, we have to make them real numbers. So we have to replace the X's with actual demand values. And we're going to be mining this list of the demand values 
that are characteristic of that item, and that's the bootstrapping part of the Markov bootstrap. The Markov model is just a way of saying in the future, how are we going to alternate between having no demand and having some demand? And we have um, this simple model, which some of you may know about, which says in this particular case, we think that if you're, you have no demand now, there's a 60% chance that the next month you'll have demand and a 40% chance that you'll, you'll the next month will be another zero. And likewise, if we are in a month which has demand, then there's a 50-50 chance that we'll have another demand next month or we'll go back to zero. And those probabilities come from looking at the actual historical data. We can say there were five instances where we started at a zero, and in two of them, we went to another zero. If we go back here, here we're starting at a zero and it's followed by a zero, so that's one. And here's the second one. We started at a zero, we were followed by a zero. This is one where we started at a zero and went to something else. Here we had a zero, went to something else. Here we had a zero, went to something else. So we can estimate these numbers. And of course, we'd want much more data than this to get good estimates. And we can convert those into the probabilities. So two out of five of going from zero to zero is 40% which is right here. So we can use this model to generate sequences of future demand in terms of something or nothing. And that's what we see here. If we want, given the 12 months, to have a future of three months, a lead time of three months, and to see what will happen then, we need a, a value for month 13, month 14, and month 15. So if we go back to our original data, we ended on a non-zero month. So we're starting, if you will, in state X. And so the next one, month 13, has a 50% chance of being another X and a 50% chance of being a zero. So in replication one or experiment one, this is what happens. We, we go from something to zero. And then the Markov model says, well, the next one could be a zero and the one after that an X. And we do that for maybe 10, 50, 100,000 uh, examples. And so these are scenarios of how the next three months can play out. And to finish the job, we need to replace the X with something. We're saying in month 15, there's going to be a non-zero value. What might it be? And our very practical answer is, well, this item has certain ranges of values that occur. It's probably going to be like one of those. So let's go back to the list. And we say, here's the list of the way we're seeing demand for that item. Let's pick one of these at random. That's called bootstrapping. And so we might pick any one of those. It might turn out to be a three. Now we have a complete scenario. The next three months could be zero, zero, three. And the thing we care about, remember, is the total random demand over the lead time, which is three months. So we add these three and we say, here's one possible value of the lead time demand, three. And we just do that. We beat this problem to death by repetition, which is easy. It's all mechanical. The next scenario was a 098, which gave us a 17, and then a 340, which gave us a seven, and then three zeros, which gave us a zero. We do this many times, and now we have a good statistical picture of what's going to happen over the next three months. It could be zero, it could be seven, it could be three, it could be 17. Maybe it could be bigger than that. So all we have to do is compile those into a histogram. And here's an example of one from another data set. This is the total demand over a lead time, and this is the number of scenarios that had that demand. So this is a probability distribution. And we see that for this data set, the most likely thing to happen over the lead time is nothing. Uh, there were 50,000 scenarios. So about half the time, that lead time is gonna be totally idle. There will be no depletion of the stock. And if you knew that, you probably would just say, okay, let's not order anything. Even though that we're, we're at the reorder point, 
you know, the little bird tells us nothing will happen, so we'll just save some money by not ordering a replenishment. Yeah, but you can't just do that as a policy because sometimes you could have an 80. So this tells us the full oddly shaped distribution of how the demand can play out over the time it takes to replenish your stock. Then we can use that to make design decisions. So this dashed blue line, if you can see it at 16, is the average number of units demanded over the lead time. If we said, let's let the reorder point be here, let's set it be 16. And some of the thinking in the field is that crude and mis misguided. Well, well, we'll reorder what we what we use on average. Well, that will be sufficient for all of these scenarios because none of them will demand more than 16, but all of these scenarios will end up in stockouts. And it looks like a monstrously high probability of stocking out, which is to say just horrible customer service. If we decide, for instance, that we want 95% chance of fulfilling all the demand, then we could use this red line at 42 and say, let's let the reorder point be here. And we know from the analysis that if we do that, 5% of the time we'll be regretting it, but 95% of the time it will cover the need. <coughs> and so that's the key information we need to then turn the problem over to the business values of the designer to say, can I afford a 5% stock out rate? And maybe that's a very competitive uh, answer, but we might want to have a higher inventory level for a more critical part. And if we wanted to have a 99% reliability, we could just move this out until we get to the 99th percentile. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so very quickly, we'll take this to some more practical level. If we want to do a true inventory optimization, then we would like to have a more extensive simulation. And we might be choosing not a reorder point in an order quantity, but some of you know about min max. The min is a reorder point. The max is an order up two level, so it's a random order depending upon how, how far below the reorder point you are. And what we do is we do this. This, instead of simulating one cycle, simulates an entire year of daily data. We have daily demand here. We have the on-hand inventory here. We have when we ordered and how much here, and we have the number of back orders and when they occur here. <clears throat> and all of these three, the on-hand inventory, the replenishments and the back orders, come from the very simple logic of the inventory. At the end of the day, you have what you started with, minus what you sold, plus what came in to replenish. That's basically the logic of the, of the inventory equation. And from that, you can simulate, say, a year of operation or 100 years of operation. And with 100 years of operation, or in this case, 1,000 simulated years, you can look at the estimated performance in terms of very important metrics. The operating cost, which is the cost of holding the inventory, of ordering more, and of disappointing your customers, the shortage cost. You can look at the average number on hand, which is important for uh, space planning and also for calculating how much of the company's cash is tied up in inventory instead of being used for good things like giving bonuses to your people. And then you can have performance metrics from the customer's point of view, the service level, about an 80% chance of, of getting through a replenishment cycle without a stockout, or the fill rate, which is a different measure of, um, of service. The service level, for instance, just says you're going to either pass or fail in a cycle. You either gave people everything they needed or you failed. The fill rate is like partial credit grading. You gave them nine units and they wanted 10, so we'll give you 90%. So the certain scenarios really are, excuse me, are about generating this top line. 
and then that becomes a fuel for a model which gives you all these, which in turn produces performance metrics you can use for designing a system. So um, let's recap this. We talked about two different targets for scenarios. They can either be inputs to models or inputs to human eyeballs. If you're interested in the human eyeballs topic, as I am, there are extra slides available, which you can get after the talk, which talk about using the bootstrap to create visually credible scenarios. We talked about where scenarios come from, manual processes, Geppetto's workshop, one trace, parametric models, or time series bootstrap. We talked about the four criteria for scenario generators, fidelity, variety, quantity, and cost. We showed how one of the simplest ways to do this, the Markov bootstrap, can be useful for generating scenarios of intermittent demand. And then briefly, the, we talked about the payoffs. These are fuels for simulation models of systems, and they're the first essential step in system optimization to go through the design space and um, and come up with a satisfactory system design and to give a have a pretty good idea before you implement it of how it's going to perform. <clears throat> and maybe a final word. You may recognize this gentleman when he was younger. It's Han Solo in the Millennium Falcon, and he is talking to Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker before this moment had been practicing his lightsaber technique against a little floating droid called a remote. So it was a simulation of, of combat. And Solo says to Luke, look, good against remotes is one thing, good against the living, that's something else. So when we talk about the, the moral lesson here is when we're talking about scenario generation, we have a certain amount of fidelity and variety but we will never quite capture the essence of all the gnarliness of real life. Yet the practice against the remotes is still a useful step. And so it, it makes sense to pay attention to the kind of technical developments that I was talking about today. Uh, thank you. I think we're ready for questions. Great. So the first one is, are there any cases where a parametric approach would be more efficient than bootstrap? Um, I think if if you had a nice problem mm -hmm. where, for instance, the data really were Poisson, um, then it's it's just convenient at least to do that. And in fact, when I showed the final, uh, the four line example with the the green was the input and then we had the, uh, the that green line was just, if you saw the, the labeling, it's just Poisson process because it was easy for me to just say, give me a year's worth of Poissons. Um, so there's a convenience factor and there's a, it's nice if you have a theoretical construct and you can synthesize or, or summarize the demand with a single parameter, like the Poisson has one parameter. So yes, if the world is nice to you, then the, then the theoretical models, the off the shelf models have advantages. It's just that we find that the real life um, customer data is usually so gnarly, so complicated and, and ugly, if you will, that it's hard to justify the simplicity of the mathematical approach uh, and, and say, well, you're cutting too many corners to use it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a sort of related question to that. Are there any assumptions when you use Bootstrap? Yes. Yes. What sort of assumptions yeah. then? Yeah, the Markov Bootstrap has certain, every model has weaknesses and let's list them. The Markov Bootstrap assumes that the data points um, are, have no trend mm -hmm. and no seasonality. Mm -hmm. Lately, we've, I think, finally cracked the problem of allowing a bootstrap to handle both trend and seasonality. So that's coming out in our next generation of products. But uh, there is that. It does take account of one very common complication, which is autocorrelation. The Markov part of the model allows there to be the burstiness. Mm -hmm. uh, so it goes that far. There's another 
another uh, generic weakness in the bootstraps. If you think about uh, looking at a series of, you know, I think I showed 12 monthly data points and the biggest one, I don't know, maybe it was a 10. Well, the, Mark the Markov bootstrap by itself is never going to show you a scenario with a number bigger than 10. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's entirely focused on what actually happened in the world. And of course, it's quite possible for there to be an 11 or a 22. So in practice, we added what's called jittering. We just take the Markov bootstrap result and we say, well, plus or minus a random amount. Mm -hmm. And so it is possible with that little um, modification to get numbers bigger than you've ever seen before. And it turns out we did that heuristically, and it turns out that that really does help uh, estimate the peaks of a future distribution. Not perfectly, but it goes a long way to doing that. So yes, there, there is that. The, the Poisson, of course, has no upper limit, so it's never going to stop at 10. And it will give you some small chance of, you know, 100. Uh, so that is an advantage to the theoretical models. The bootstrap, its strength and its weakness is it's looking at reality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and re the reality it sees is one of the realities that the world can give you. That's why having a long set of data helps the bootstrap be more serviceable. OK, thanks. That's a good uh, question. <laughs> there is a question from John. Let's. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, my question just follows on from what you've just said. Obviously, having a long history is helpful because you've got more to resample from. But at the same time, as it gets as the data gets older, some of that older data may not be so relevant because it could have been at a different level, whatever. So yeah. how how in practice have you got around that problem and found some sort of sweet spot for the, you know, a good length of, of, of data to, to resample from? Yeah, that's a real adult question. <laughs> I'd expect nothing less. Um, that wasn't a problem before because our customers, uh, for better or worse, had very limited demand histories. And it was very aggregated at the uh, monthly level, for instance. So 36 months generally for spare parts was pretty stable. But now the speed of business is increasing and all of our computations in our current software are organized at least around a daily aggregation, not a monthly aggregation. And so all of a sudden everything is 30 times longer. Mm. <laughs> and we are seeing that. And so we've developed, uh, we've started a, a tackling the problem which in the literature is called the regime change detection problem. Mm -hmm. And there are some uh, neat algorithms. We've made one, there's some open source where um, you can basically go through the demand history and identify points at which the character of the demand changed radically. Mm. Now that's useful in itself. From a marketing point of view, you would like to go back and say, something happened 18 months ago. Let's do some detective work and find out what that was. But from a forecasting point of view, you might say, OK, everything. We only want to use the data since 18 months ago because we're in a different world now. So that is uh, that has become a real pressing issue as the speed of business goes down. I think in retail settings, uh, hourly is becoming, you know, more important, more practical to think about. So uh, regime change is a way to filter the history and find uh, what's happening now and just do the bootstrapping on that. Yeah, that's very interesting, as you say, because of the more granular data. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Uh, we still don't have any more questions from the audience, but I still have a few questions. <laughs> Uh, so you actually mentioned uh, treating seasonality. Can you say anything about how it's done? Because this is one of the questions that bothered me uh, over the years. Well, again, to, to John Boylan's point, if you're blessed with a lot of data, in some ways it can be a curse, as we just said, but let's assume generally it's a blessing to, to have more data. Well, if you have more data, then you could basically do a model for each season. Uh -huh. Right, so uh, now that we're doing uh, daily data, 
items often have multiple levels of seasonality. There may be a month of the year, you know, Christmas season, summer, but then you have weekend effects. So all of a sudden there's not only seasonality, it's very common to have double seasonality, day of week and month of year. And sometimes if the data are weekly, there's still um, month of the year and week of the month. Like if, if you're in a locale where everybody gets paid at the last week of the month, then certain retail things get busy when people get their paychecks. So um, we've been developing techniques to test for and exploit double seasonality and they're extensible. We haven't seen a need to go to three levels yet, but when we start having customers that are working at an at an hourly level, then it'll be hour of day, day of the week, month of the year, maybe week of the month, month of the year and so, and so forth. Um, yeah, so so if if you have enough data, then the simple minded solution is just section it. I'm going to have a model for Monday morning. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a model for Monday afternoon, that sort of thing. Yeah, that reminds me actually of the approach that some people use in uh, energy forecasting because they would also get the profiles for hour of day, for example. Yes. Yeah. OK, well, what about autocorrelations? What if uh, demand sizes are auto autocorrelated? Do we need to do something additional? Or is it not very often met? That, that's a good question. That's something that it's a blind spot in what in the Markov bootstrap. Because we we didn't see that in, in the customer data we were looking for, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist in the world. And especially now with higher frequency data, it could be more of a problem. And so early on when we were inventing the Markov bootstrap, that was on the list of candidates and we pruned it from the list because it didn't seem necessary. But I've been wondering about whether I think that's an open question. It might be good to uh, to go back and <clears throat> and actually, if you're still keeping the bootstrap paradigm, to bootstrap the scatter plot of demand size and demand interval. Um, John Boylan especially has done a lot of work in perfecting the so-called Crosstons method, and that. That is a clever way of looking at intermittent demand by turning it from one time series into two. It's a time series of intervals and a time series of magnitudes. And so you can imagine just making a scatter plot of interval and magnitude, mm -hmm. and then it would be a simple issue to just set, resample the points. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's autocorrelation in there, I think you'd have to do something a little bit more complicated. You're really sampling two consecutive scatter plots. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's in itself, you know, that's at least a master's thesis. <laughs> okay, Robert, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, well, as a sort of outsider to uh, intermittent demand, I've become very aware of how it's grown in importance for the reasons you've already mentioned, Tom. And uh, in some companies, I think about, about Amazon, but I'm sure it's not unique. There's been uh, much research in the area in terms of essentially global estimation of intermittent demand models. That's on the one hand, so any thoughts about that and of course how it relates to your topic where essentially you've got a, um, a segment, let's describe it as a segment anyway, of an inter, uh, interrelated series, the interrelationships of which are essentially unknown in the estimation, of course, they're not used really directly. Yes, um, two things pop to mind. First is the, to reinforce your premise. You know, as if you take a non-intermittent demand series, which is what you'd often see when the data were aggregated the 30, 30 day months, and then you start splitting it into days, things become intermittent that never looked that way before. And as you go down to hourly and month and day, you know, but minute by minute e-commerce types of situations, then there, it's hard to imagine anything not being intermittent. So the urgency of analyzing intermittent demand is just going to increase radically over the next couple of years. And then um, I think I don't know everything Google's up to. I've seen some of it, but I think Robert, your question has to do with um, 
simultaneously thinking about multiple intermittent streams. There might be, for instance, different uh, variants of the same product. You have the blue one and the red yeah. one and the green one. Oh. And if I'm not wrong, some of the coolest new ideas have come out of your school. I'm, I'm, I'm not remembering the name of the people who are doing this stuff, but um, to look to look at hierarchical forecasting um, and to look at the lowest level, which is very intermittent, and then and to look at several levels is in the M5 competition and going up to some product line total, which is less intermittent. And so I don't know enough about that, but I think that's a really hot research area to think about um, what Fred Mosteller used to talk about is borrowing strength. You, you work on one item by using information from its sister items. Yeah. And, um, you know, we long ago, we had a very primitive version of this. We would, we would look at a product line total and then we would just study the individual items as a percentage of the total. We'd forecast the total, which was usually pretty stable. And then we would say, well, 18% of that is going to be this item. So that's our forecast for the item. And we could, the percentages would change so we could forecast the percentage. So there are ways to, to do that. And I think that's that's a very important frontier area for forecasting. Well, it's not uh, is Nikos Karens is actually online. He usually uh -huh. is, and uh, uh, on the other hand, he might, he'll tell us if he is, <laughs> and he, he he won't be modest. So he has made the uh, uh, innovations in that area. And of course, John, you you've looked at seasonality in that context as well. I was going to ask you something related, though, Tom, because with seasonality, yes, you can look at groupings and so on. What about with um, slow trends? So. When we're getting to the end of a life cycle, you can you can have a very slow decline in, which is very hard to actually see really in practice, but you can have a very slow decline. And if we use classic bootstrapping, we simply repeat what's happened recently. So we don't capture that, though we do capture all the variability, as you said. Is there, do you have any thoughts on that about the best way to address that? Yes, we actually have an algorithm for that. Mm -hmm. um, Secret world. <laughs> uh, it's it's not out for sale yet, but uh, yes, so there, there we have one handle on that. I can't say that it is the universal answer, but it, it seems to be uh, good enough for government work, as they say, um, and it, it does capture that phenomenon. And it's 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 actually computationally it gets a little bit more expensive, uh, but but there is a way to approach that um, by uh, the short answer is here's the secret sauce change the resampling probabilities okay yeah 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 that <laughs> absolutely makes sense it, it is something i've wondered about for a while yeah now that makes yeah. sense yeah but what gets tricky is when you start when you go the other way when things are exploding so you're starting to have to bootstrap values that you've never seen before so you have to imagine beyond the tail of the distribution that's been observed. Yeah. And there are, call it reasonable heuristics for doing that, or at least we have one. Okay, no, that's fine. I'm, I, won't, I won't actually divulge your secrets anymore. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> the trick the trick in, with the down, down thing is to be able to compute it quickly. Hmm. So there's another step of approximation in there just so that you don't have to wait uh, our customers might have 50,000 items to forecast and uh, the the more speed we give them, the more impatient we train them to be. <laughs> so they want to click something and not go away for a cup of coffee to wait for the results. They want to sit there and get the results. So we we have this design dilemma about doing something not quite as right, but fast versus taking the time to do it more purely but frustrating the user who doesn't need that much precision. <laughs> no, absolutely understood. OK, thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Well, I think we can wrap up. The only slightly weird question that I will ask is the final one. 
Uh, what do you think will be the the trends in the in the area in the software development and specifically in intermittent demand? What should we expect next? Uh, well, I don't know. I might be leaving that problem to my successor. I keep mm -hmm. thinking that I've run out of ideas and then one pops up, but I'm not sure there are any more left. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I keep my eye on what's happening at Lancaster uh, to, to maybe get some inspiration. Uh, we're starting to look at other types of problems at our company beyond this one. And uh, so that's sort of taking some of my attention, like predicting spot prices of electricity, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and the Internet of Things is a very tempting playground for developing new methodologies. Mm -hmm. And we're we're uh, actually working on some stuff about uh, what the CIA calls automated tipping. As to say, you've got the Internet of Things and you have very low, uh, low capacity, maybe battery operated intermittently on kinds of sensors. And there's that comes into a sort of primitive forecasting or analysis capability. Well, let me put it this way. Here's an example. Suppose you're interested in meteors. And so you have a kind of a, a camera with one of those fish eye, uh, bug eye lenses where, you know, there's a million little eyes in a ball and each one looks at a part of the sky. And so if there's a little bit of a flash there, it could have been a moth going by, it could have been an airplane, it could have been a meteor, it could have been Cherenkov radiation. So you, you've got a detector and there's a, a little thin line coming into a, a, a little single processor is one part of a chip. And um, it says it starts to say something interesting is happening at that angle in the sky. Maybe it's something we should study. And so you're looking at the whole sky that way. And when you, for instance, have a way of forecasting that there's going to be more flashes. Or you just look and say it seems to be retrospectively, it seems to be heating up there. Then you you send that signal to a big specialized telescope and you can't look everywhere. So you've told it where to look and then you really analyze to pieces that piece of the sky. You're looking at chemical signatures, you're looking at different wavelengths of the whole thing. So you have the Internet of, of Things giving you very simple cues that there's something interesting happening in a spot. Maybe it's seismic, you know, you're looking at little shakes and maybe you want to focus attention on an area that could be the next earthquake. So it's a, a general kind of thing. Um, and so we're we're doing some work with that general problem now. Um, so, you know, there's all there's always something cool to think about. <laughs> and Thanks. when I retire, I'll keep my one day a week for just fun toys. <laughs> trouble, is your, trouble is that I'm speaking personally rather than about you, Tom. Uh, the brain retires as well partially and of course that's why you're not choosing to retire to try and discourage it anyway very very enjoyable and uh, thank you for jo joining us my pleasure yes thanks a lot tom uh, thanks everyone for attending we will have two more events uh, this season so stay tuned and see you all in two weeks i guess bye bye bye